Welcome to the third of our four talks on uh, American presidents of the 20th century. Uh, my name is John Foster. I'm a reference librarian here at the Manor Public Library. Those of you who are habitués of the library will have seen me at the reference desk where I spend all my time. Um, I have, for those who are interested, I have a doctorate in history from the University of Washington uh, and a bunch of other degrees of varying usefulness. Uh, <laughs> I have a library degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which I really value not so much for what I learned about libraries there, although I learned a lot, but because everyone should spend a couple of years in Chapel Hill. It's really a wonderful place. Harry Truman. There's a sort of interesting, not theme, progression, what have you, to the, the presidents that we've talked about so far in the respect that they have been, by and large, uh, internationalists in the sense that uh, Teddy Roosevelt was very pronounced, uh, was very, very much in favor of a sort of uh, American imperialist policy. Uh, Truman was, not Truman, let's, let's jump back. Wilson was a very convinced internationalist, uh, tried and failed to get the United States into, uh, to, to be the driving force of the League of Nations. The League of Nations ultimately uh, collapses catastrophically. And then we have Truman, who once again is a kind of, uh, is, Riding sort of comes in at the end of the Roosevelt presidency. The, those of you who remember my talk on Roosevelt or just you know, know about the history of the Roosevelt presidency will remember that in the mid-1930s, uh, or in the late 1930s, as, as Hitler uh, uh, rose to power and became uh, more clearly aggressive in Europe, uh, Roosevelt was handcuffed in his ability to help European allies by a series of neutrality acts passed by the US Congress. And the thinking was, Europe's got to sort its own self out. We're not going to have American boys coming home in boxes because people in Prague or you know, wherever, some other place that most Americans don't care about uh, can't, get, can't get themselves sorted out. Um, Truman, uh, for, uh, in a lot of ways, shapes the way that uh, the United States relates to the rest of the world and has done ever since. Uh, this process really starts under Roosevelt, but it's Truman that really brings it to fruition in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and we'll talk uh, as we go on about how that's the case. Uh, on the 12th of April, 1945, uh, Truman was working in his office when he got a call uh, to come to the White House. He uh, knew that the president was in Warm Springs, Georgia, but he thought that the president might have come back. Uh, he hurried over to the White House, uh, not knowing what he was going to, why he was being called over there. He hadn't talked to the president very much. Roosevelt didn't really care who his vice president was by this point. We'll talk a little more about this later. But he really, um, he was very much sort of shut out of the kind of Roosevelt circle that had developed in the White House over the over the of the 12 years of the, of the Roosevelt presidency. When he got to the White House, he was told that Roosevelt had died of a stroke. Uh, he went up to the family quarters where he found uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. He offered his condolences and he said, uh, is there anything I can do for you? And Eleanor put her hand on his shoulder and said, the question is, is there anything we can do for you? For you are the one who are in trouble now. Uh, <laughs> And it's a very Eleanor thing to say. I mean, if you know anything about Eleanor Roosevelt, she's this incredibly composed woman who, in the moment of her grief and finding out that her husband is dead and that he's died in the company of someone who he'd right, been having a sort of you know, relations that she considered inappropriate, whatever they were, uh, her first concern is for, for his, you know, his situation, and I think this is really a sort of uh, a, a mark of the, of the sort of breadth of her character. Truman was born on the 8th of May, 1884, in Lamar, Missouri, which is a small town in the sort of western part of Missouri. His father uh, was pretty well off at that point. He speculated in livestock and grain, real estate to a certain extent, but mo mostly on the livestock market. And they lived a very nice uh, sort of middle class, upper middle class existence. They had a house in town. They moved around from place to place, finally settling in Independence. 
This is the house that he was born in, in case one wonders. This is his father, John Truman, and his mother. The western part of Missouri at that time was very democratic, and that is a very much a, a, a bastion of the Democratic Party. And Truman said that it wasn't until he was about, you know, into his teens that he actually met a Republican. Um, <laughs> In 1900, he was a runner at the Democratic National Convention in Kansas City. His father was very active in local Democratic Party politics. Uh, in 1901, uh, his father found the ruin that strikes most speculators eventually. Uh, he lost money, tried to sort of recoup himself by betting big, lost even more, ended up about $40,000 in debt and having to take a job, I, I believe, as a night watchman at a, at a, at a grain salad or some, some, no member of the Truman family had ever worked for wages, apparently, up to that point. So, uh, and it was a real come down. Uh, Truman graduated from high school in 1901. He went to work as a, as a railroad timekeeper. Uh, then he went to work uh, <coughs> in Kansas City at the National Bank of Commerce. Um, he, uh, his brother went to work there too, and also working there and living in the same rooming house was Arthur Eisenhower. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower's older brother, and they all sort of became friends. This is, okay, so when you, when you are around Ohio, many of you have, have lived here uh, for a long time. I've, I haven't lived in Ohio all that long, but the more one learns about Ohio, the more one learns about how imbricated it is in the history of American politics. So many famous politicians, so many important figures came from the state of Ohio. One thing that I've learned is how many important figures actually came from the state of Missouri, which I would have never known. In any case, so he, uh, he was sort of getting along in the world. He, uh, he went to about one term of college, but, but dropped out. As a matter of fact, Truman is, I believe, the last US president not to hold a college degree. He never, never graduated from college. In 1906, uh, his father decided that he was going to rent a farm and make a go of it that way, and he told Harry he just had to come back and work the farm, and Harry did it. Um, he was very, he was a little, this was a kind of blow to his ambitions, but on the other hand, his father needed him, and that was it. So, you know, he went back to, to the farm, getting up at 4.30 in the morning, going out and plowing rows, shifting stumps, the whole uh, farm life. In, the, in, the, uh, in this period, too, he begins courting uh, Bess Wallace, who he had known since uh, grade school. Um, eventually, he asked her to, she asked, he asked her to marry her. This was a little bit later, 1911, I believe. And she said no, um, which really didn't dampen his enthusiasm. I mean, <clears throat> Once again, this tells you a lot about Harry Truman as, as a guy. He just thought, well, this is a setback. I'll just ask her again at a later point. And, and also, this didn't stop her from, from loaning him money for a couple of very bad ideas that he had. One was trying to uh, run this zinc mine in Commerce, Oklahoma, uh, which ate up all the money and produced nothing. And then another one was, uh, was uh, running a sort of oil drilling company uh, which also uh, came to nothing, although apparently, once he, like, uh, several months after he sold the concession that he had, they hit oil, and he would have been a millionaire if he just held on to it, but that's the way it goes. Truman had joined the National Guard in 1905 and had uh, uh, worked as an artillerist. Um, this is an interesting fact. So Truman was a kind of bookish guy growing up. He played the piano. He described himself later on as kind of a sissy, although his friends mostly didn't remember him that way. His eyesight was very bad. He would wear these very thick glasses, and he was actually uh, legally blind, I think, in his left eye. Um, so uh, it, was, it was rather surprising that, but if, they're, if you're going to put someone, you know, in a position, I guess artillerist is maybe the best, because it's all about mathematics anyway, about which he knew nothing. We'll get to that later, too. <laughs> Um, but when the war starts in 1917, he'd, he'd gotten out of, the, out of the National Guard several years before this, but he joins up in the spring of 1917, uh, goes for training at Camp Donovan, Oklahoma, which was sort of connected to Fort Sill. Um, it was a really nasty place, very dusty, uh, also very cold. Uh, but he sort of, he ended up running the camp commissary, 
uh, with a fellow named Ed Jacobson. And um, uh, apparently he made a really great job. But this is, you know, something uh, that it's worth remembering about Truman's character. He was always a great guy for uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. He was very good at the sort of uh, keeping things on budget. The fact that he had those business failures was not so much, I mean, the mistake he made was getting into something he didn't know how to do. But for this, he was very good at. And he, he eventually rose to the rank of lieutenant. Uh, he came up in front of the very hard-bitten uh, general uh, of that particular part of the army to, to be, uh, he was being recommended for promotion to captain. Another lieutenant had submitted his sort of service report, which was absolutely glowing, and the general read it and apparently said, this can't be true because no man is this good. <laughs> uh, so uh, he, he went through the interview, which he thought he botched terribly. Uh, but after being shipped over to France, he then discovered that he was, had been promoted to captain. He leaves New York on the 29th of March, uh, 1918, uh, on the George Washington, which was a confiscated German passenger liner. Uh, he arrived in France in April, in the middle of April, 1918. They sent him to ar artillery school. And, and here he really had to, he was really challenged because he had no more than a high school education. And any one of you who's ever been in the artillery or knows very much about it will know that it's very much about math. So he had to sort of take a crash course in how to do it. But once again, this is the thing you find about Harry Truman. If it comes down to who's going to work harder, he's always going to win. He's one of the most assiduous and dedicated workers of any person who ever occupied a position in American public life. And People talk about him being uneducated, which is really not true. Uh, he did not have a degree, but he was always reading. And if you, if you read his speeches, they're laced with, uh, or read his, the sort of the descriptions of, of conversations he had, it's laced with references, classical references, references to uh, the history of Greece and Rome. I mean, he's, he's self-educated to a really remarkable degree. And, and this is how he overcomes the math thing, too. He just worked hard enough to make it happen. In July 1918, he gets put in charge of Battery D, the 129th Field Artillery. Uh, this was composed mostly of uh, pretty hard-nosed Irishmen from Kansas City. They had already dispensed with three captains by the time he uh, got the job. He was apparently very nervous, but he told them at the beginning, they didn't send me over here to get along with you. It's your job to get along with me. And then he busted a couple of people for, uh, down to private for breaking rules or taking leave when they shouldn't. And he won the, the respect of the guys because he was tough, but he was fair, and he was consistent. Uh, and he did what he said what he was going to do. You know, if he said he was going to do something, that was what Harry Truman did. Uh, in the fall of 1918, they take part in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive. Uh, they move up the first time. They get sort of uh, caught in a, in a, in a uh, counter. They sort of open fire on a German unit. They get caught in the counter battery fire because the, the, one of the sergeants had been an hour late bringing up the horses. They knew once they fired that they needed to move because once you shoot at somebody, they have a pretty good idea of where you are <laughs> if, if it's artillery fire. Um, so they start taking fire, and the men all start running. And Truman, this is one of the sort of uh, signature moments of his, of his career, just absolutely plants his feet and lets them have it with every curse that he knows. And he's grown up on a farm in Missouri, so he knows a lot of them. And he gets the guy's attention, and they get back to doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that was a perfect illustration of, once again, uh, Harry Truman finding within himself to convert a bad situation into one that, uh, where he was going to get done the things that needed to get done. Uh, in the course of uh, the war, Battery D sustained, I think, 120 or 126 casualties, no fatalities. So, OK, this is the artillery, and you're not, it's not like jumping out of the trenches and running at the machine guns. Um, 
but still that's a pretty decent record. And part of it is luck. This is why they call them casualties. Like, because in modern warfare, not getting killed oftentimes is just a matter of dumb luck. I mean, those of you who've seen Band of Brothers will probably remember that scene where the three of them are in a foxhole and the dud shell lands there and they're all sort of looking at it and then one of them decides he's gonna smoke his first cigarette. Uh, because there's just, you know, the luck of the draw happened that the fuse didn't work on that one. And, but nonetheless, another reason why uh, he's successful in this job is because he gets the guy, he had the guy's attention and he had them doing what they needed to be doing when they needed to be doing it. After he comes home in 1919, he decides that he will start a haberdashery store with his, with his army buddy, uh, Ed Jacobson. And it should be remembered too that, so uh, in the wake of the, in the years after the war, he uh, really maintained the loyalty of the guys who had served under nine, un, underneath him in, the, in Battery D. And so at all points during his political career, even through the time that he was president, he always had these Battery D guys around getting out, getting the word out for him. When he was campaigning for judgeships or whatever in, in Missouri, he always had his guys from Battery D, they were all locals, going around to the various towns talking about what a great guy Harry Truman was and organizing things for him and being in parades with him. And it played a, a, an important role at the level of state politics, for sure. Uh, so he starts this haberdashery store. He kind of runs the front end, and, and, and um, Jacobson runs the, the sort of the business end, the sort of money end. Uh, it ends up failing, not once again, really because of anything that Harry Truman did wrong. It just happened that in 1921, there was a catastrophic recession. Uh, and people just weren't spending that much money on, you know, shirts and hosiery. Um, and so the store eventually fails. Uh, and it, it saddles him with a fairly significant debt. Apparently, as if I recall correctly, he didn't actually pay the debt off until 1935. So he goes back to farming. Once again, he had, he had proposed to Bess uh, in, in 1911. She said no. Uh, when the war happened and he was joining up, uh, she said, well, maybe we should get married. She really liked him. She just went, partly it was her mother. Her mother, you know, the, it's, it's, it's often said uh, that, that, that Bess Truman's mother didn't think that Harry Truman was good enough for her, and that's true. She didn't. She didn't think that any man on the planet probably was good enough for her daughter. So, um, but, but Bess Truman in, in 1917 says, or Bess Wallace says, well, 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 we should get married now. And Harry says, no, because uh, it's very possible that I'm going to come back from this a cripple. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, uh, be forced to, to, to be, you know, you shouldn't be trapped by that. So, uh, but in, in 1919 when he comes back, they do get married. And this is one of the great... Uh, sort of romantic stories, if you will, in the history of American public life. I mean, really, uh, Bess and Harry Truman were uh, uh, not, in addition to being very in love with each other, were very good friends. And, and that's a very, it's a very warm story. I mean, the, the, there's, there's a collection of their letters, which I really recommend, because they're really very warm and very, very sort of heartwarming to read. Uh, they had a daughter, Margaret, who Harry Truman, as she became older, was very uh, careful. She wanted to be a singer, and he did all that he could to sort of not try and promote her career because he wanted her to succeed on her own. Although at one point, uh, when things were going badly, uh, I think this was in 1950, she got a bad review uh, in, the, in the Washington Post and a number of other papers, and he, his press secretary had just died suddenly which is why this was allowed to happen. He hand wrote a note to the, rev to the culture editor for the Washington Post in which he threatened three or four different kinds of physical violence uh, and, and sent it. Like he wrote, Harry Truman wrote a lot of letters that he didn't send. I mean, he'd write these letters sometimes in a kind of rage and his press secretary would be like, yeah, that's, that's great. I'll just put this in the drawers. And, um, but, but no one was around to stop him from writing this thing, which is a very unfortunate. But of course, you know, you, it came off very badly in the media, but the fact of the matter is, like, he's a father, and you can't 
you know, he would have had to be, uh, a, you know, of, of a remarkable type if he wasn't going to take something like that kind of personally, so. In the, having sort of failed and, and being confronted with the prospect of, of working the land again, uh, he gets into politics and he gets associated with uh, the Pendergast machine. Um, this is Tom Pendergast, one of the famous, most famous bosses in the whole era of machine politics. Uh, his son had been in the army with Truman uh, and his son introduced him to, or his younger brother, not his son, his younger brother, excuse me, Jim. Uh, and he, uh, you know, saw Truman as a kind of a, a, a right guy. And so he got him elected to a county, uh, a county judge position, which was an administrative position. It wasn't like sitting on the bench. It was kind of what we'd call a county commissioner now. He uh, then was not reelected in 1924. In 1926, was elected once again as a as a part of the Pendergast machine uh, as a as a presiding judge, which was a, a bench position. But he uh, he didn't fit in very well uh, because he wouldn't do what Pendergast said. So very much, you know, you, go, you all know how machine politics works. The, um, it's all about you scratch my back uh, and I'll scratch yours, or in this case, I'll get you a position and then you give contracts to my corrupt friends. Truman really wouldn't do it, and oddly enough, Pendergast thought that was okay, because he figured the, the thing he knew about Truman was that he would do what he said he was going to do. And that was, you know, it was a little annoying to Pendergast that, so one of the things that Truman was very involved in was rebuilding the roads or paving the roads in a lot of this part of Missouri. And he absolutely refused to give contracts, preferential treatment and doling out contracts to Pendergast's corrupt friends, which was very annoying to him. But he also did, you know, at a, at a certain point in his frustration, he later sort of, he wrote this kind of letter to himself in which he said, you know, uh, I had to give out like a lot of money in order to prevent myself from having to give out a lot more money to really corrupt people. So he was constantly sort of trying to fight against the, the boss system. Um, the Pendergast, like whatever sort of malign thing you can think of, Pendergast was involved in it. He ran gambling, he ran brothels, uh, he was hooked up with the local mob, there were some fairly <coughs> notorious massacres in Kansas City at the time. Um, he himself uh, was reputed to have lost something like six million dollars uh, in gambling over the course of his life. So this was an important moment in Truman's life for the good in the sense that it got him into politics. So by this time, you know, he's in, he's, uh, he's 38 and he uh, hasn't really sort of, I mean this is the interesting thing about Truman becoming president which we'll get to just a minute down the line here. It's as if your next door neighbor became president. I mean, it's the closest thing that the 20th century offers to, because really, 1934 is elected to the, to the US Senate, once again, with sort of Pendergast's uh, connivance. Uh, and I mean, the whole range of shenanigans goes on there, ballot stuffing and, you know, the dead for Truman and, um, but, but everyone did that, I mean, the, the, like this is, this is not, Pendergast was just a better operator than most of the other people. It's not like the other side wasn't stuffing ballot boxes too, let's just be clear. Um, and as far as we know, Truman didn't really know anything. I mean, he really, you know, it's one of those things where like, if, if, if he wanted to know, like probably he would have known, but he didn't want to know. 1934, he's 10 years from being president, and this is the first time he's been in public life outside of the, the borders of the state of Missouri. So he's elected to the U.S. Senate, and um, he's often referred to as the senator from Pendergast. He really, the Pendergast <coughs> thing was real baggage for him. A lot of other members of the Senate didn't really want to talk to him because they thought he must be terribly, terribly corrupt and associated with the, everyone knew who Pendergast was and everybody knew that if Truman was the senator from Western Missouri that he, uh, he was very sort of lonely in his first days, and I'm trying to, like, I have this marked. 
he, he did make friends with some people. And the thing that I really recall about this is um, uh, Hamil, Hamil, J. Hamilton Lewis, the, the senator from Illinois, came up to hit room, visit him, went, or sat down beside him and said, Harry, don't start out on an inferiority complex. For the first six months, you'll wonder how the hell you got here. And after that, you'll wonder how the hell the rest of us got here. <laughs> uh, so he tried to make himself uh, useful. He was very uh, committed to the New Deal. Uh, he had been a, uh, uh, involved in the, in the Federal Reemployment Agency in, in Missouri, which was a New Deal uh, work promotion scheme. He voted with four New Deal measures in practically every case. During this period, uh, Pendergast started to uh, be investigated quite seriously by anti-corruption uh, forces in Congress. And uh, Truman didn't disavow him. And the thing that's sort of worth remembering about Truman is he was very loyal to people who were loyal to him. Uh, in almost every case, like there's, there's one case where I will, that I will talk about later where he, where it's not, not so much, but um, people kind of referred to him as get along, go along Truman, you know, he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't raise his voice very much. Um, he got on the appropriations and, and interstate commerce committees. Uh, when the war starts, he becomes interested in what's being done with the money. So this is after Pearl Harbor, uh, when uh, a very large amount of money is appropriated for the building of army camps, for uh, the making of munitions. And he keeps getting letters from constituents saying, well, things are not right in the way this money is being spent. So Truman gets in his car. And uh, just to jump back for a second, when he rebuilt the sort of road system in Missouri, the way he sort of figured out how to do it was he got in his car and drove around to a bunch of other places and saw how they did it. He was very much into sort of, let's go see what's going on, right? So he gets in his car and starts driving around to all these project sites down in the south, and he drives, drives an incredibly long way, and he just sort of shows up, and he doesn't really tell anybody who he is. He just starts asking questions. Why is all this lumber sitting here? Why you got 35 guys sitting around on this job site not doing squat? Uh, and he finds some very disturbing things about how the money is being used. At the same time, also, there are, Washington is full of these sort of what are called dollar a year men. And these are uh, business leaders who've come to Washington to sort of work in the federal bureaucracy and for a pay of one dollar a year. But the sort of other side of the coin is the reason they're doing it is because they're trying to direct federal contracts to businesses with which they are associated. So Truman decides that something needs to be done. And he, 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 uh, he calls for the formation of a committee, an investigative committee. The, the Roosevelt administration is like, oh, God, this is the last thing we want, right? We got a bunch of other things to worry about. We don't need some guy from our own party, you know, making waves. So, but they say, well, okay, so we'll have this committee, right? Hopefully we can just sort of like underfund this thing and it'll die on the vine. So they, they allow them to form the committee, but they give it $15,000 in funding, which is essentially like deciding that you're gonna like fund it out of the, the, you know, this change that you find behind the cushions and the couch in the old executive office building. I mean, it's really, it's, it's really nothing. Uh, but he gets a staff of investigators and a couple of, and a secretary, and they start going after people. And he holds hearings, and he calls business leaders and people who have these contracts up to explain what is it that they're doing and how are they spending the money? And you know why are they spending it on this and not that? And you know, you know why are they not coming through on what's in the language of the contracts? Uh, and he's very successful. Uh, fairly soon, they up the funding to fifty thousand dollars, which is still not a lot of money. Uh, but he's doing something that people really like. I mean, so people are still okay. It's after Pearl Harbor, and people are very uh, upset about this. You know, they're very upset, but they're mostly you know. They want to sort of get in, punish who did it, and, and sort of get out. But uh, so Truman is telling people a thing that they really want to hear, which is, let's, if we're going to do this, let's not like just sort of pour money 
on the problem. And he ends up, by some estimates, saving the government about $15 billion in 1941 money. So you can multiply that by about a factor of 10. And it's once again, because Harry Truman is a dot the I's and cross the T's kind of guy. He's, you know, he's a very liberal in the American progressive sense of liberal sort of way. So he's constantly, we'll talk about this a little later. So he's not one of these guys who doesn't, you know, who's, who's, who's not okay with spending money when he thinks it needs to be spent. But his deal is, if we're going to spend money, it's going to go to the things that we say we're going to spend it on. We're not going to pad it out with these, you know, cost plus contracts or whatever. We're going to, we're going to hold people to account. If they're going to get taxpayer money, it's going to be spent in the way that they've agreed to spend it and not on a bunch of other, you know, have people standing around doing nothing. 1944, he gets drawn onto the Democratic ticket. He didn't really want to be vice president, and in fact, nobody did. Uh, Cactus Jack Garner, the famous Texas politician who was Roosevelt's uh, first vice president, uh, famously added uh, one of the great sort of uh, phrases in uh, American political life when he described the uh, vice presidency as not worth a pitcher of warm piss. Uh, <laughs> The, the, the vice presidency was a place where sort of political careers were sent to die, by and large. Um, now, of course, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, because McKinley got assassinated, by and large, like, the, the vice presidency was a real road to nowhere. Um, so he, the, the problem, the sort of Democratic Party higher-ups didn't want, okay, everybody knew let me just back up a, here, a second here. Everybody knew that uh, Franklin Roosevelt was not in good shape. I mean, he was, he was, he was very pallid. He had huge dark circles under his eyes. Uh, Tom Matowitz and I were talking the other day about what his blood pressure reading was, and it's just startling. I mean, the fact that he didn't explode uh, at some point is really remarkable, and that he was able to carry on as he did. So the Democratic Party, the, 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 uh, the vice president at the time was Henry Wallace, a very liberal Democrat, very close to the labor movement. Um, the Democratic Party higher-ups absolutely didn't want him to become president <laughs> if Roosevelt was to die, which people weren't talking about, but which everybody sort of knew was, could very easily happen. Uh, the other choice was the senator from South Carolina, uh, James Burns. Uh, Burns was a real favorite of the conservative Democrats from the South. He was an ardent segregationist. And for that reason also, the, uh, the Democratic higher-ups didn't want him. They thought that he would cost them support uh, with, from labor. Uh, they thought that he would uh, cost them support from African Americans. So they were looking for a third option. And it's, it's not coincidental, by the way, that the chairman of the Democratic Party at this time was Bob Hannigan, who was a Democratic Party operative from the state of Missouri. Uh, and so the idea gets floated, well, let's get Harry Truman. You know, he's, people kind of like him. He's, you know, he's affable. He's, he's formed this committee uh, that saved the government a whole bunch of money. He's a good guy. Nobody strongly dislikes him. Uh, and this is how, often, you know, <coughs> how it so often happens in American politics. Those, those of you who know about the sort of the way that uh, Abraham Lincoln became president and the sort of Republican Party uh, National Committee uh, or uh, National Convention, uh, when, when he was nominated, he was the sort of, third of, sort of third of three choices, but he got through because sort of his guys convinced everybody that the supporters of A didn't want B and the supporters of B didn't want A, so why not vote for C? Um, and this is how Truman becomes president. The one real, or vice president and eventually president, the one real downside is that the, uh, this is one of the few moments when, there are two moments here uh, at which he really annoys his wife. One of them is by becoming the candidate for vice president. Bess absolutely doesn't want this. Partly because uh, she just was not a great fan of public life, partly because her father had committed suicide when she was a child, and she was afraid that that was going to come out in the media. It was not widely known. Um, another time that he annoyed his wife was at the sort of campaign stop 
Truman got out and he's playing piano. He liked to sort of play piano in front of people. And all of a sudden, Lauren Bacall jumps up on the piano. <laughs> And Truman is really not, not sure what to do, as I think most of us would not be. Um, you know, so he just keeps playing, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and Lauren Bacall later on was like, oh my god, it was, you know, it was terrible. My, I was this young woman at the time, my agent kind of told me to do it. It wasn't, I didn't sort of concoct to get up there. But um, Bess was just furious. And after, after he sort of got off the stage, Bess told him, like, you're not playing piano in public anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Roosevelt and Truman win. Uh, Truman is vice president for 12 weeks, uh, during which he is pretty completely shut out from the, from the Roosevelt circle. And interestingly, I mean, this is a sort of interesting side, like the conversation he has with, with Eleanor, because he was very suspicious of her as he was of all the, 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 the Roosevelt people. But they became quite good friends. Uh, so that uh, at one point, so she was getting a large amount of condolence mail. And Truman had let her use the White House secretarial pool to write responses because she wanted people to get, if they were going to write a condolence letter, she wanted them to get responses. And this is thousands a day. And finally, uh, Eddie McKim, who was one of her staffer, one of his staffers, one of Truman's staffers, and an old buddy of his from the army said, told the, the secretary pool, okay, no more of this. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, and he used the following phrase, isn't going to be on the White House gravy train anymore. Well, this got out to the press, and Truman fired him. Uh, and this is one of the only cases that I can think of where Truman uh, dropped the hammer on someone who had been, by and large, very loyal to him before. But he just said, sorry, that's it. Partly because he, you know, out of a sense of propriety, but partly because he really came to like Eleanor a lot. They really shared a lot of, I mean, he was more progressive in a lot of ways than Franklin was. Eleanor used to really, for lack of a better word, kind of hassle her husband. And she would come up with these sort of proposals. She was a very smart woman and very committed politically. And she would sort of, he, Franklin Roosevelt had a sort of a box beside the bed, and he eventually he said, you know, just, just put your suggestions in here, and, and I'll, I'll work with one a day. Uh, that was the sort of way their, their sort of marriage and their relationship went. But Truman and, 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 and Eleanor really found that they quite liked each other uh, because I think they shared a lot of, of, of political views. And they also... It's funny, too, because it's one of these kind of relationships that Truman has. There's a number of them in his life where he, uh, he's just a kind of Joe Everyman American, and he can be friends with a lot of different kinds of people. So Eleanor, who comes from a uh, very wealthy uh, Teddy Roosevelt wing of the Roosevelt family, uh, is a million miles from him socially, and yet they really just like each other and see something in each other, that uh, see a kind of mutual interest. Uh, Truman was in trouble. <laughs> Roosevelt was a damn tough act to follow, not surprisingly. Um, and almost the first thing that happens to Truman is that he has, gets s sort of set up for preparations for uh, the meeting to set up the United Nations in San Francisco and also the Potsdam Conference after Germany surrenders. And he has this very famous meeting with uh, uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister. Molotov was this old Bolshevik, one of the few old Bolsheviks who Stalin hadn't had murdered, uh, and a real hard-nosed guy. And one thing that happened when Truman became president was he found out what it was exactly that Roosevelt had been promising to Stalin. Roosevelt, once again, this is, many people made this weird mistake of thinking that they could sort of finesse Stalin. I mean, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, I don't know why I keep calling him Roosevelt, Roosevelt thought that he could charm Stalin, which he could not. He, the, Roosevelt thought he could charm everybody, and he, he couldn't. Truman also thought that, you know, uh, once I get the measure of Stalin, you know, he could be negotiated with. Or, the, the, the funny thing is that the only person who really got Stalin was Churchill. Uh, Churchill, I mean, Churchill didn't trust him any farther than he could throw him, but he knew 
that once you knew what Stalin wanted, he was very predictable. The key was not to get sort of, you know, Stalin could be a very nice guy if he wasn't trying to have you murdered imminently. Uh, you know, he could be, he was fun to sort of have a drink or 12 with. Um, <laughs> But you needed to not mistake that kind of backslapping, let's have another toast of vodka, for serious political discourse. And Churchill never did. Churchill really had the measure of Stalin more than most other people. Truman sort of discovers that what's going on is that the, the Soviets are essentially setting up buffer states, like puppet states, essentially wherever they, they are. And the agreement that had been made at Yalta was that uh, you know, states would have their own, be able to choose their own sort of form of government. Well, the Soviets thought, I, I really, they really did legitimately think that what was being said here was, we're going to set up our kind of states where we control things, and you can set up the kind of state you want where you control things. Um, so that at a certain point in the discussions, uh, you know, the, the discussion of Eastern Europe is going on, and the, the Soviet representative, I can't remember whether it was Stalin or, or Molotov, says, well, it's not like you're asking us what's going to go on in, in Italy or Greece, so, you know, why is it you have... The, the big problem was Poland, where it's very clearly uh, the Russians, the Soviets had arrested a whole bunch of, of Polish, like, uh, uh, non-communist political leaders and uh, did them the courtesy of throwing them in jail as opposed to just having them shot. Um, the people will, those of you who remember your World War II history will remember that uh, one thing that Stalin did was had about 20,000 Russian or Polish officers and bureaucrats and other people uh, simply taken out and executed when they, uh, he took over the eastern part of Poland in 1939. Anyway, Truman has this meeting and in this meeting it's himself and Molotov and a Russian interpreter and uh, William Leahy, his chief of staff, Admiral William Leahy, and uh, Chip Bolin, who was the uh, sort of Russia specialist from the State Department. And they're going along. And Truman says, like, well, look, you people are just not carrying out your agreements in Poland, and I think this is really terrible. And, uh, and he really reads him the riot, reads Molotov the Riot Act, and Molotov kind of goes ashen and says, this is one variety of the story, we'll just get to that in a minute. What, Molotov says, well, I've never been spoken to like this in my life. And, and Truman says, well, carry out your agreements and you never will again. Uh, I mean, and it's, it, it's a plausible story because it's very, it's very Harry Truman. I mean, he's just, you know, like, what would you say if you were in a meeting with Stalin or Molotov and, you know, and you knew that they had been setting up a proper government in Poland? What would you say? Yeah, just don't do it. Look what, you agreed not to and now you are. But Molotov was also very confused in a way because he thought that they were just doing what we were doing. Um, now, there's a kind of a false equivalence here between like a, a slavish communist puppet state on the one hand and a, a like, malfunctioning democracy like we got in Italy or Greece or whatever, but that's, that's another issue. Uh, another version, Chip Bolin, who was there, said that it wasn't actually Truman who did this, that it was Leahy. Uh, Leahy was a notoriously crusty guy who stood for no foolishness whatsoever, and uh, according to Bolin, it was Leahy that really laid into him, uh, which I believe too. But the, the, the thing about the story about Truman is, number one, it's too good not to repeat, but number two, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a very Harry Truman thing. I mean, the guy was just sort of very down to earth. Uh, let's not have any, you know, shenanigans in politics. Let's just say what we mean, and then we'll get stuff sorted out. He heads off to the Potsdam Conference, which is basically a conference about how they're going to organize Europe after the end of the Second War, World War. And um, while he's sort of waiting for it to start, uh, a new era dawns in the world. So I'm going to try and play this thing, and it's probably not going to work, but I think it's a really good clip. So we're going to start with this. This is a clip of, about the Trinity bomb test. silence of the morning. 
at 5.29.45 Mountain War Time. The Jornada del Muerto was bathed in an intense flash of a light that man had only seen from the stars. I think that's a very compelling piece of footage because the, you know, how would you feel in that sort of moment? You're, you're J. Robert Oppenheimer. You've worked like mad for three years to get this thing going. And now you realize that what you've created is a weapon that could denude the earth of life. And um, I'm, I think it's interesting that at a number of points in the sort of development of atomic weapons, they would be sort of testing these things, and the idea would come up, well, is this going to ignite the atmosphere on fire? And they couldn't 100% say that it wouldn't. As a matter of fact, the, the Castle Bravo bomb test uh, at Bikini Atoll in the 50s turned out to be like significantly more powerful than they predicted that it was going to be. And there was a sort of moment at which the scientists were like, hmm, I wonder if, like, but it worked out. Um, so the... The United States had been developing the atomic bomb uh, since 1941, uh, beginning with what was called the S-1 Committee, and then under the auspices of what was called the Manhattan Project. In total, they ended up spending about $2 billion on it. Interestingly, so Truman sort of went into the Potsdam Conference knowing he had this sort of ace in the hole. He had been sort of told about it in, in oblique terms. Uh, he, he knew about the program, actually, when he was running the Truman Commission because he was sort of trying to figure out where all this money was going. And he, he sort of mentioned it to someone and was sort of told by the administration, you can't talk about this program. I mean, you can't even talk about something. He didn't even know what the program was, but he was like, you can't even talk about this thing at all. Um, interestingly, Stalin already knew because the, he had spies. Uh, so he knew probably almost before Truman did, that we had detonated this bomb. And maybe we should talk for a moment about the bomb. So it's, it's one of these sort of, I got in an argument with, with someone I know, I should never argue on the internet, um, <laughs> about Truman, in which he was like, Truman was a racist and a coward and yada, yada, yada. And OK. Every president, U.S. president so far, probably at least prior to Jimmy Carter, has been a racist um, in one form or another. And there's more and less malign forms of racism, not to say that, that racism is OK, but there's racism like uh, resegregating the federal government, as Wilson did. And then there's racism like Harry Truman, uh, who used a word beginning with N and a word beginning with C to describe African American people in private conversation, but who actually took concrete steps, oftentimes ones that could very easily have had very negative consequences for himself politically, uh, to try and improve the condition of race relations in the United States. Okay, so let's be clear. There's very little chance they would have dropped this bomb on Germany. The, the narrative about Asian people was that they were not quite human. And that's not, I mean, there's a really great book by a person who's, I think the author is Nyan Shah called Contagious Divides. It's about uh, Chinese people in San Francisco and the way that they were viewed. And if you look at the government records, problems with them are almost referred, almost, almost always referred to in epidemiological terms. Um, 
They dropped the bombs. Okay, so this friend's like, he's a coward. I'm like, he's a coward? I mean, okay, he was an artillerist in World War I. And what was he supposed to do? Fly the planes over there himself? I mean, I, I just don't understand. But, um, so why did they drop the bombs? Uh, the Japanese at this point knew that they lost. They had known for a, a year that they were not going to win the war. But there was still a very strong faction in the Japanese government that wanted to have sort of one last catastrophic battle that would uh, either they would all go out in a blaze of glory, or they would force the Americans and their allies to uh, allowing them to surrender at some point less than unconditionally. So this was one of the things that came out of the, the Potsdam Declaration was that Japanese had to surrender unconditionally. There was no chance that they were not going to use it. Let's just be clear. They'd spent $2 billion on this thing, number one. Number two, uh, the estimates of the possible US casualties for an invasion of the Japanese home islands range from uh, 20,000 to completely ridiculous. Um, and if you're the president, let's be clear, you owe uh, some consideration to US soldiers. If you're going to sign up to uh, put your life on the line and possibly give the last full measure of devotion to the country, the guy leading the show has an obligation not to throw your life away needlessly. Um, people say, oh, you know, it's like they could have. Let, let's be clear, too. There were almost, there were very few military age people in any large Japanese city at this point. I mean, they were mostly out in other places in Manchuria or in the, the Pacific Islands. Um, you can kind of see this was the on this is on the first of August the areas that Japanese still did control. The U.S. had just had a very savage fight to take Okinawa, in which the Japanese suffered ninety five percent fatalities or something like that. I mean, they just they they were not very into surrendering, and also too the U.S. had intelligence, and this is true when we it's been confirmed later that elements of the Japanese army were training like women and old people to undertake suicide missions. So. It was going to be a pretty hard fight, for sure. But uh, also, where did they drop these bombs? Well, they didn't drop them on Tokyo. As a matter of fact, the 1944, early 1945 raid on Tokyo, firebomb raid, killed about 100,000 people and was like the most, the most lethal single attack in the, uh, in the history of the war. Um, and, you know, Let's, let's look at the atomic bomb, too. The atomic bomb is, differs in quantitatively, not qualitatively, from dropping a lot of firebombs, which is what we've been doing for years already. I mean, the, the British had systematically undertaken studies with firemen on how to, how to set buildings on fire, and we did, too. We used to drop. There's a really great book by a guy named Jörg Friedrich called The Fire, which details this uh, extensively. They, so the, they did this in Europe quite a bit, and they did it. It was easier in Japan because the cities were all made of wood. But in Europe, they would, the first row of bombers would go over and bomb the roofs off all the buildings. And then the next uh, wave of bombers would come, and they would drop a thing called a fire staff, which is about that big hexa hexagonal uh, tube that would go through the floor and then start a phosphorus burn that would last about a half an hour. And that was why the... I mean, the firestorm, Hamburg, 1945, Dresden, or 1944, Dresden, early 1945. Um, those were just very bad versions of something that was being done everywhere because the idea was it's very hard to bomb factories. Uh, according to some estimates, German uh, industrial production only declined by about 10% in the course of the war, and we bombed everything we could find. I mean, by the early 1945, uh, U.S., Bomber Command is having trouble finding other stuff to bomb. Um, so what they decided, I mean, what they had decided earlier on was bombing the factories is hard because they're, they're made of stone or concrete and they're, they're sort of widely spaced out. It's better just to bomb the places where the people in the factories were, live. The people, the workers from the factories live and burn them up. So <coughs> horrific as killing 50,000 people in a gigantic fireball is, uh, it's it's only a sort of, it's only quantitatively different than other things that have been going on. And it was a normal practice of war in those days, which is, you know. So it's a complicated ethical question, and you're free to think about it as, as, as you know, people whose names have been signed under it, as, as all Americans are. 
Um, but they didn't drop it on Tokyo. They didn't drop it on Kyoto. They didn't drop it on. Uh, they dropped it on two sort of relatively smaller cities. Um, they dropped the first one. In between the first and the second one, the, the Japanese had really made the decision to surrender. But also, the Russian army had invaded Manchuria, and the Japanese forces there began to disintegrate. And what the US government wanted least of all was for the Japanese to, or for the, the Russians, the Soviets, to take large parts of Manchuria and maybe get into the Japanese home islands, and oh my god, how much more complicated would that make things? So they dropped the second one to kind of like speed the process along, because what they didn't want is, is more Red Army complications. I mean, it's arguable, this is one other sort of piece of the puzzle, that, that actually fewer people died because they did this. So once again, this is something, there's a lot of good books on it, which I, I recommend that you, that you peruse. This is just about the development of the bomb, which is less. This, I think, is a really great. This is sort of one of the sort of hand drawings of how they were going to make a bomb. Like, this is sort of like firing this uranium slug into another thing. And it's just kind of funny how, like, physicists work. Like, yeah, we'll just do this. Uh, in this period, uh, a number of important documents that really define US foreign policy are issued. First of all, on the 22nd of February 1946, George Kennan, the, Sh the Chargé d'Affaires, the US Embassy in Moscow, sends to uh, the State Department uh, what's known as the Long Telegram. It was an 8,000 word telegram, which is pretty long. He starts out by saying, like, I'm sorry for messing up the telegraphy lines, but um, which is a very in-depth analysis of what's up with the Soviet Union. So for a long time, we just haven't really known. You know, should we sort of deal with them in the way we dealt with other powers? You know, we don't like them necessarily, but, you know, they're our allies. Um, Kennan says, look, the Russians, Russians have never really known a friendly neighbor. So they're always edgy about the people around them. So they're always going to be wanting to expand because they want to create a buffer between them and everyone else. And also, communist ideology says that uh, capitalism and communism cannot coexist peacefully. It's maybe a little more complicated than that, but he's not really wrong. Now, he does say, Kennan does say in the Telegram, now it's obviously false that they can't co coexist. I, I think that's a little much. I mean, I, I think that the US government would have been perfectly happy. As a matter of fact, Truman had said at some point, you know, after, after Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, uh, <coughs> Germans killing Russians and uh, Russians killing Germans is a win-win situation for everybody. So, um, and this is the thing that, I mean, starting in 1943, there's a, uh, there's a really great book by Gabriel Kolko uh, about the sort of origins of the Cold War in the, in the, during the Second World War. By 1943, the US government is already starting to sort of see, like, okay, after the war, what's the big problem going to be? Well, it's going to be communism. Um, and the Soviet Union in particular. So Kennan sends this telegram in which he basically said, uh, the only way to deal with, this, the only thing the Soviets understand is force. Right? So what we need is this policy of, of containment. So wherever they try and expand, we've got to meet them with force. Because if we don't, things are going to get out of hand and we're going to get the Third World War. So if we stop them in these small things, we can prevent the big thing. Um, in the middle of this, too, uh, Churchill makes his uh, Iron Curtain speech uh, in, in, in Truman's home state of Missouri, once again emphasizing the point that a new system is taking over in Eastern Europe and a new sort of political uh, situation is rising. This, Truman, Churchill at this point is out of government. Uh, he, he's forced to leave about halfway through the Potsdam Conference because they've had an election and, and uh, the conservative party, the Tory party, lost. Uh, and so he was replaced, um, although he was, was prime minister later on, too, many of you probably know. The 24th of September, 1946, the Clifford Elsie Report. This is Clark Clifford, who was uh, uh, one of Truman's advisors, very well-placed uh, advisor to many presidents. Eventually, uh, if you ever watch the, uh, the PBS Vietnam War documentary that came out in the 19, early 1980s, which I really recommend. There's a moment at which Clifford uh, and the rest of the people from the 
Johnson administration met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff to find out what was going on in Vietnam. And they were like, well, how many more people is it going to take? And they couldn't tell them. And so he was, Clifford was later on sort of instrumental in Johnson sort of coming to the conclusion that the war had to be de-escalated, although Johnson also then decided not to run for president. But that's another story. Maybe we'll get to that some other time. He also later came to grief in the BCCI scandal, which some of you may remember. And it's very sad because he had a really long career in public service, and I think a very distinguished one, and then got involved with a criminal bank and did bad things to his reputation. But in any case, so the, the, the long telegram, let's be said too, like uh, Leahy thought that this was so important that he had it copied to every single person who had the security clearance to read it. Uh, I mean, there were like hundreds and hundreds of copies of it because he just thought, yeah, this is exactly like the, the, the stance that we need to take toward the Soviet Union. And this is the stance that would shape American policy for the rest of the, the, the period that the Soviet Union was exi in existence. As a matter of fact, so I, I'll just tell this story it's next minute or two. I was, a, I was a teaching assistant in the course on the Vietnam War that they gave at the University of Washington. And uh, the, the professor had two guys come in, one of whom had been a, a military intelligence interrogator in Vietnam. He was very, he thought the war was a terrible idea, had been terribly undertaken, was a, was a very pronounced anti-war activist. The other guy he brought in had been a, a marine helicopter pilot and I think was working for the company later on because he talked about flying around in Cambodia. Um, his view was that we won. And the way that he knew we won was because the Russians didn't really try and take over any more places after Vietnam. I mean, I, I think this would come as a surprise to the people in Afghanistan. But, um, but essentially his thought was Vietnam was right because what did we do? We blunted communist aggression. And that's very much a sort of the, our whole involvement in Vietnam is a, is a knock on from the Truman Doctrine uh, uh, announced to Congress uh, in, in March of 1947 in which he basically said, we are going to take a hard line stance against communist aggression wherever it happens. We're not going to negotiate about it. I mean, we can negotiate about it after, but we're going to send, if we need money, if we need troops, particularly to Greece and Turkey, uh, Greece had a very strong communist insurgency going on at the time. Um, uh, the Russians had an interest in Turkey going back hundreds of years uh, because they wanted a warm water port, which they did not have. Um, also, there's the famous uh, X article that takes that was published in Foreign Affairs in July of 1947. It was written by Kennan. Everybody knew he was written by Kennan, but because he was a an official in the, in the embassy, he couldn't sign his name to it, even though everybody knew. But it was basically an extension of this idea. The Soviet Union internally believes that they cannot coexist with us. One system, they believe that one system has to go or the other. So they're not just going, there's not going to be some sort of equilibrium in our affairs with them. We have, and so we have to, we have to take them on. And then NSC 68, which is the major policy doc, document that sort of creates the, the sort of the national security state that exists to this day. Uh, NSC 68, uh, in the wake of NSC 68, which once again was about creating the, uh, the capacities, the military uh, and intelligence capacities to cope with the Soviet threat, uh, one thing that resulted was the tripling of the military budget. Truman was very unpopular. His Popularity got down to the mid-30s, coming up to the elections of 1948. And he, uh, nobody gave him a chance. There, there was a point at which uh, Time Magazine, I think, did a sort of survey of 50 kind of opinion makers or whatever, or sort of experts about who they thought was going to win. And all 50 of them picked uh, Thomas Dewey. Someone, I think it was Eben Ayers, who was one of the White House staff, came to Truman and told him about this. And Truman said, you know, I know all 50 of those guys, and not one of them has a sense it takes to pound sand up a rat hole. <laughs> I, I really love Truman because he really, and so Truman's response to this was, okay, if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down with my guns blazing. So he got on a train and just went around to every town that he could visit. He gave three, four, five speeches a day. He hung out with people. He met them. He talked to them. And the thing about Truman was he was really a folksy guy. He was really one of those people who, when you met him, 
He was a good guy to hang around, even if you didn't agree with him, by and large. He had a very engaging personality, and he understood. He had been out there at 4.30 in the morning, plowing straight row after straight row, and if he plowed a blank row, like his father would give it to him, you know, for the rest of the day. So he could relate to the people in the small towns who worked with their hands, you know, who knew what it was like to work hard, and not work hard by mean like read a lot of pages, but by getting out there and pulling stumps. I mean, his father injured himself in the way that caused his death by trying to move a boulder that was too large and just straining himself too much. He was not given a chance by anybody, and yet, and yet he won. And I want to read this quote. This is a quote from Avon Ayers that, that goes, I think, a long way to explain it. Uh, Were it not for all these predictions and the unanimity of the pollsters and experts, I would say that the president has an excellent chance. He's, this, he's said this at the, toward the end of the election. All the signs that I see indicate it. The crowds which have turned out for him on his campaign trips have grown steadily. I cannot believe they came out of curiosity alone. Other conditions are favorable to the president, the general prosperity of the country. It is contrary to political precedent for the voters to kick out an administration in times of prosperity, and the economy was doing very well. The, the Dewey personality and campaign has not been one to attract voters. He is not liked. There is universal agreement on that. I have repeatedly asked individuals, newspapermen, and others if they could name one person who, they ever, who ever said they liked Dewey, and I have yet to find one who would say yes. <laughs> the Dewey campaign speeches have dealt only with national unity, with the promise of doing things better and more efficiently. He has not discussed issues early, clearly or met them head on at any time. I have repeatedly asked my wife if it is possible the American people will vote for a man whom nobody likes and who tells them nothing. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the differences here are important because Dewey was this very kind of cold, stentorian guy whose shtick worked in New York State politics, but not so much on the national level. And talking about unity is what you do when you have no other issues to talk about. The economy is doing fine, you know. Um, but here, too, I think is a moment uh, where something else interestingly interesting can be uh, illustrated about Truman. While he was in the middle of this campaign, and doing very badly, according to the polls. Uh, an acquaintance of his from Missouri wrote him a letter saying, uh, I think you should lighten up on the whole civil rights thing. Nobody wants to hear about civil rights. It's, it's costing you popularity. And he took the time to wrote, write a letter back to him in which he wrote the following. The main difficulty with the South is that they are living 80 years behind the times, and the sooner they come out of it, the better it will be for the country and themselves. I am not asking for social equality because no such things exist, but I am asking for equal opportunity for all human beings, and as long as I stay here, I am going to continue that fight. When the mob gangs can take four people out and shoot them in the back, and everybody in the surrounding country is acquainted with who did the shooting and nothing is done about it, that country is in a pretty bad fix from the law enforcement standpoint. When a mayor and a city marshal can take a Negro sergeant off a bus in South Carolina, beat him up and put out one of his eyes, and nothing is done about it by the state authorities, something is radically wrong with the system. On the Louisiana-Arkansas Railway, when coal-burning locomotives were used, the Negro firemen were the thing because it was a back-breaking job and a dirty one. As soon as they turned to oil as a fuel, it became customary for people to take shots at Negro firemen, and a number were murdered because it was thought that this was now a white-collar job and should go to a white man. I can't approve of such goings on, and I shall never approve of it as long as I am here. I am going to try and remedy it, and if that ends up in my failure to be reelected, that failure will be in a good cause. Um, I, I really think that that just speaks volumes about the kind of guy that Truman was. He was willing to come out and take a position that he thought was right, even if it was going to affect his political position negatively. And I think that that, I mean, that's a kind of moral commitment in American politics that you don't quite see so much anymore. Um, quite shockingly, he won the election. This is absolutely my favorite Truman. Because you can't help but, I mean, even if you did, my grandfather, I've, some of you have heard me say, many of you probably heard me say, once when I was about 10 years old, told me that he wanted to tap dance on Truman's grave. At the time, I was like, who's Harry Truman? But, 
uh, my grandfather's a very rock-ribbed Republican uh, and, and, and didn't like him for whatever reason. My grandfather was a wonderful guy and I'm sure did not really want to tap dance on his grave. But, um, <laughs> but it's, the more you get to know about Truman, it's really hard not to like the guy. Even if you disagree with what he does, he's just a, he's just, you know, he's a fighter and he's a good guy. Uh, he gets a sort of short honeymoon period, 1949. Uh, and then the Koreans, North Koreans invade South Korea. And it goes from bad to really bad, really fast. We just don't have that many soldiers. There are about 300,000 North Koreans invading. Clearly they've been planning it for a long time. You can see in the series of maps, this is June 25th, 1950, as they cross the 38th parallel. Uh, by September 14th, U.S. and Republic of South Korea forces, Republic of Korea forces are penned in in what's called the Pusan perimeter. And so, uh, but by this time already, so they start shipping in troops from Japan. The U.S. starts mobilizing again. There's a lot of antipathy toward this war in the United States. U.S. citizens are constantly writing Truman saying like, my son came home in a box. Why did he have to die for Korea? It was a hard case to make. But by this time already, things are starting to kind of turn around. Um, uh, Matt Ridgway has been brought in from Japan to be uh, one, of the, one of the army commanders under MacArthur. And MacArthur comes up with this brilliant plan to land at Incheon, southwest of Seoul. The Incheon landing was one of the most daring moments in American military history. There's no beach at Incheon and there's a very pronounced tide. So if you get it wrong, there's nowhere to go. Uh, but MacArthur, student of military history, knew that the Japanese had landed there in 1904 during the Russo-Japanese War. So he knew that it was possible. And when he did it, he caught the North Koreans completely by surprise. Uh, within a very short period of time, they had managed to uh, liberate Seoul, and then they start moving north. Uh, and so he has this discussion with Truman. There's very, this is, these are some pictures which we'll get back to in a minute. Um, so 15 September 1950, the Incheon landing, 15 October uh, 1950, Truman flies to Wake Island to meet with MacArthur. And they have a very sort of cheery meeting in which MacArthur says, well, crossing the 38th parallel into North Korea isn't going to be a problem. And I, I very much doubt that the Chinese are going to attack. So Truman kind of, they had this sort of glad handing session. And Truman's like, wow, ah, he's actually a pretty nice guy. I thought he was kind of a blowhard, but you know, he seems all right. Um, MacArthur had kind of been in hot water because he had talked about using like nuclear weapons, uh, which there just didn't need to be any loose talk about that. And also, nuclear weapons are in the hands of the civilian government. So he's not in a position. The commander in chief is the only one who can really be making public statements about that. True, MacArthur can't. And so he had gotten sort of slapped down, a slap on the wrist, if you will, for that. But so MacArthur goes back, and, um, and they invade the north. Uh, and they for some reason do not notice the massing Red Army, Chinese Red Army troops uh, that descend on particularly the 1st Marine Division uh, at the Chosin Reservoir up here in northeastern Korea. There's a horrific battle that goes on there in temperatures, sub-zero temperatures. Uh, the, the 1st Marine Division stages one of the great fighting retreats in the history of modern military history. I, I really recommend, there's a number of really good books about this, uh, about the war generally. I really recommend Max Hastings' book about it. It's about 25 years old now, but it's still, I think, a really great book. Um, uh, these are, I think, Sabres, US F. Sabre yeah, that's an F-83? 86. 86, yes. Um, I see it. This is a great thing. I know somebody will know these answers. Um, these are, that's the Chosin Reservoir. Uh, they're U.S. mortarmen. Uh, this is a, like a, a bomb strike on a North Korean uh, production facility. This, I wish I could have blown this up a little larger, but it wouldn't 
it would have pixelated. But here, these are a bunch of uh, Marines hanging around. And you can see, if you could see it more closely, you would see that they all have snow all over their helmets. Uh, so it was a really nasty condition that they were having to fight in. And what happens is the, the, the Chinese, Red Chinese, uh, managed to push, and the, and the North Koreans managed to push us sort of back down. Uh, Seoul falls again. Uh, MacArthur once again starts making, I mean, all right, he's in very bad odor with the president anyway because he's allowed this to happen by overextending U.S. forces. But then he also starts talking about maybe we ought to nuke China. Um, and, and that just, the, Truman just can't have that. So he's forced eventually uh, to fire him, which he does in a very... He did it in a way as not, such, so as not to disgrace MacArthur. But MacArthur then proceeds to fly back to the United States and stage a kind of victory tour across the United States, um, which also did not go over very well with Mr. Truman. Um, and, and, and there was a sort of moment at which, you know, there's a lot of talk, well, let's just replace Truman with MacArthur. Um, <laughs> Fortunately for the United States, that didn't happen. And in fact, what did happen was that Matthew Ridgway uh, was made commander of, of US forces in Korea. And Matt Ridgway is one of the great American heroes as far as I'm concerned. He really pulled the chestnuts out of the fire. He managed to get the situation stabilized and get us into a situation of stalemate, essentially, until 1953, until the summer of 1953, when Eisenhower uh, negotiates his way out of it. Now, Eisenhower could do that, right, because he's a Republican. I mean, it helps. Like, still the McCarthy, I mean, I've, I've sort of glossed over McCarthy here. Um, uh, because what's going on here is sort of McCarthy, who nobody liked anyway, uh, decided that he was going to pump up his, Joseph McCarthy, the senator from Wisconsin, junior senator from Wisconsin, decided he was going to pump up his military career by claiming, on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, that the State Department was shot through with communists. Now, it might have been. McCarthy just never presented any evidence that that was the case. I mean, there were a number of cases where it turned out that people had uh, had, had inappropriate friends or whatever. But uh, McCarthy, uh, he was a drunk and a blowhard. I mean, I'm, I'm just not going to. You, you can read books about him, and, and maybe people will disagree with that. I, I know that. A uh, number of books trying to sort of recoup his reputation have been written. I really think that that's that he had a very pernicious effect on American public life, and and because and played on people's fear, people's justified fear about the Soviet Union. Right? Everybody like there's a reason. There's a, being frightened of communism, being frightened of Stalinism, is a perfectly rational thing to be. Um, but what we don't want to do is start eating our own entrails out. Uh, and chasing people out of public life, chasing good people out of public life uh, on the basis of a, a real dearth of actual evidence. Truman just absolutely loathed the guy. Um, one reason being that McCarthy came after, in one way or another, Dean Acheson, his, his Secretary of State, who, and this is, Dean Acheson is another case where Dean Acheson is this very sort of patrician guy who, uh, there's, there's a collection of letters between Truman and Acheson, which is really brilliant. They really liked each other. And once again, Truman, you know, Atchison was about a million miles from Truman's social circle, but once again, Truman really liked the guy. And when McCarthy and other people in Congress came at him and saying he was soft on communism, which he was absolutely not, uh, you know, Truman stuck with him because Truman thought, this guy has been loyal to me. And he knew he wasn't a communist. I mean, to argue that, no, nobody seriously was arguing that, that Atchison was a communist, like that you just, the argument absolutely wouldn't hold water. But, but people who sort of blamed Atchison for the sort of foreign policy problems the United States had, Truman said, I'm sticking with this guy. He's, he's, he's been loyal to me, and I'm going to be loyal to him. In the latter stages of Truman's administration, civil rights started to become an issue once again. With the, the, with the formation of the United Nations, some people started to say, well, if you look at the United Nations Charter, the U.S. has some real problems in terms of its, its race relations. On the 5th of December, 1946, uh, Truman issued Executive Order 9808, which formed the President's Committee on Civil Rights. 
which then issued a report called uh, to secure these rights, which essentially was a very uh, compelling attempt to look at the ways that uh, African Americans particularly were excluded from uh, the economic and public life of the country and to try and find ways to rectify that. In July 1948, Truman issues Executive Order 9981, which essentially um, integrates the U.S. Armed Forces. Uh, there was a storm of controversy right up until about the middle of the Korean War, at which point it became clear that uh, many American units were so under strength that they just could not find enough white people to send to them. So they had to accept black soldiers who fought with great bravery and distinction. Uh, he also, uh, in 1951, formed the Committee on General Contract Compliance uh, and basically also said that race couldn't be a, a, a factor in hiring for civil service jobs. And it also couldn't be a factor uh, for people uh, undertaking US government contracts. So once again, this is Truman uh, undertaking steps which negatively affected him politically, but which he thought were morally right and which he was willing to, to, to pay the price for. I mean, once again, uh, 51, it's not clear exactly, you know, he's probably not going to run again. As a matter of fact, in 1951, they also passed the, ratified the 22nd Amendment saying you couldn't serve more than two terms as president, which he would have been grandfathered behind, so he could have run again. Um, when the elections uh, started to come around again in 1952, uh, he tried to convince the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to run. He tried to convince Eisenhower to run. He had tried to convince Eisenhower to run before. As a matter of fact, he had told Eisenhower after the war, if you want to be president, I'll, I'll work for you. Truman uh, returned to independence. He wrote his memoirs for which he received a flat fee of $620,000. Uh, a little more than half of it went to taxes. Uh, the top marginal tax rate in those days was, I think, 82, 85 percent. Um, people talk about like how we're overtaxed now, and I, I, I sympathize. I, I hate paying taxes too, but the fact of the matter is, uh, the top marginal tax rate used to be a lot higher than it, was, it is now. He said that he only actually probably ever pocketed about thirty-eight thousand dollars of that six hundred twenty thousand. As a matter of fact, in nineteen fifty-eight, the uh, Congress passed the Former Presidents Act that gave uh, former presidents an annual an annuity of $25,000 a year. And Truman said that if they hadn't done that, actually one reason was because Truman was in such bad financial straits that uh, they were afraid he was going to have to go on aid. Uh, <laughs> but he mostly kept a low profile, and I think that that was the way that Bess liked it. Um, she, when they, when they, when he won the sort of, uh, the, the nomination to be vice president. Uh, it happened at about three in the morning. They're going out of the place. They're in this sort of sweaty press of, of newsmen and whatever else. And they get in the car, and Bess is just livid. And she says to him, this is what the rest of our lives is going to be like. Uh, that was one of the few times that she really got angry at him. Um, so why is the Truman, important pres Truman presidency important? For a lot of reasons. One is, I think, just as a sort of model for how you can be president. Truman wasn't one of these guys who's like, well, tell me what the opinion polls, tell me what Gallup has to say about this, and then that's, you know, we'll try and triangulate what most people want to see. Truman was constantly pro proposing things that he knew were unpopular. He, promo he proposed uh, universal military training. He, provo he proposed uh, universal health care on numerous occasions. Uh, nobody in Congress was interested in that. But he said to people, you know, uh, if I'm going to be president, I'm going to come out and be for the things that I'm for, right? And, and if people don't like that, that's fine. They can vote for someone else. But as long as I'm president, this is what I'm going to do. And I think that that's, a, I think that's something that, that we kind of miss in American public life. Let's not, you know, look at the opinion polls and then try and figure out what the policy is. Let's sort of say, go out to the voters, say, I'm going to do this. And then when you get to the White House, go out and do it. And if people don't like it, four years later, they get to vote for somebody else. Or six years later, if you're a senator, but there you go. Um, Truman creates, it's funny that this very sort of simple guy creates this gigantic national security bureaucracy. But the fact of the matter was, the feeling was in those days, and they were not wrong, 
that uh, the United States has to be the sort of leading party fighting against the spread of Stalinism. And you know, whatever you think about politics, wherever you sit on the political spectrum, no sane person wants to live under Stalinism. Um, so a lot of money has to be spent and a lot of institutional stuff has to be created in order to effectively fight against Stalinism. And this is what exists to this day. So much of, I mean, the fact that the US military budget takes up such a large proportion of the federal budget uh, has everything to do with NSC 68 and the way that Truman reconfigured the federal government in order to be an agency for uh, exerting US power abroad. I mean, after, on December 8th, 1941, isolationism was dead as a doornail, right? I mean, so if we're not going to be isolationist, if we're not going to be inward looking, we have to find some way of exerting ourselves and, and, and not imposing our values maybe, but communicating our values and impressing them upon people and occasionally imposing ourselves militarily uh, to try and make the world into a place more like the one we want to see. And you can argue about have the ways we've done that been just or well conceived? Uh, in, in, in a number of cases, I think it's pretty clear that they have not been. Um, but the fact that that is the way that the US government now conducts itself and will do for the foreseeable future has everything to do with the way that uh, Harry Truman and his uh, uh, associates, particularly Atchison, reconfigured George Kennan, reconfigured the federal government, reconfigured US uh, political and military power to exert itself in foreign, foreign affairs. Uh, so next time we're going to talk about Eisenhower, uh, who takes this to another level yet, but who ends up by giving a speech saying that the, one of the chief dangers facing the United States is the military industrial complex. So, um, so that's what I have. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I've gone way over time, but I can take a couple of questions if people want to ask them. Yes, ma'am. I understand that Bess never lived at the White House. She always stayed in Independence. Is that right? Very, the vast majority of the time. They, uh, he had an apartment, a kind of a four-room apartment when he was in the Senate uh, in D.C., just in the neighborhoods. And um, when they got into the White House, the White House was a shambles. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had to move out of the White House for a period because part of the second floor was going to collapse. Um, but she never liked D.C. She never liked the White House, which was really was a dump in those days. Um, they spent a lot of time living in Blair House, but she spent most of the time in Independence, and whenever he could, he would fly down there uh, to see her. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, currently, what, what uh, do historians uh, credit as the, maybe the major, one of the major accomplishments, achievements of his administration, and conversely, <coughs> one of the biggest mistakes of his administration? Um, clearly not perceiving the, uh, the, the Chinese threat in Korea before it happened, and also not perceiving the possibility that, uh, that, the Chinese, that going up to the Yalu River was going to encourage the Chinese. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that that's pretty clearly the sort of major, the major failing. Um, as far as the major successes, I mean, you can point to a lot of things. Like the, the civil rights stuff, I think, is gigantic. Uh, it, you wouldn't have expected it from a guy from Missouri, which is, as a matter of fact, when he joined the National Guard in 1905, he wore his uniform home to his grandmother's house, and she wouldn't let him wear it because she, she said it reminded her too much of Union soldiers. Um, so the fact that he was willing to do that, the fact that he uh, managed to reconfigure the government uh, in such a way to convince the government to spend the money that needed to be spent. Because the fact of the matter was, uh, fighting off the, the Stalinist challenge was not something that was going to be done on the cheap. Uh, so we had to spend the money. And if you want to look at successes that he had, it was actually getting Congress, getting particularly conservative Republicans in Congress. So 
Getting conservative Republicans to spend the money on national defense and national security. Getting conservative de Democrats not to bolt every time he said the word civil rights. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did uh, Truman have a vice president from 45 to 49? Uh, I, uh, it was Alban, the Alban Barclay. Barclay from Kentucky the second time around. Uh, Oh, my brain is blanking. I knew like 40 minutes ago what the answer to this question. Yeah. He did because the, right. the 25th Amendment. Right, that's exactly right. It's a possibility for four. Yes, wow. that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so yeah, he, uh, uh, yes, I owe you a beer. Um, <laughs> or, or whatever beverage you would prefer, but I start with beer and then I move down the road. Uh, okay, any other? Yes, sir. Yes, um, when you mentioned in the invasion in Japan, you quoted one number of 20,000, which would be absolutely ridiculous when, you, when we lost 40,000 on Okinawa alone. Sure, oh yeah. What, what wasn't the other end of the numbers uh, someplace around a million? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the numbers, you can, you can find numbers up into that territory. Uh, and so once again, so it's, it's, we can sort of, on an armchair, sit around later and say, well, should have done this, should have done that. But we know things that they didn't know. Yeah. And, and the bet that is being made is bets with, with the lives of US soldiers and with women and children in Japan. That's the, that's the fact of the matter, too. If I'm making that bet, and one of the possible consequences of the wrong bet is, you know, several hundred thousand U.S. casualties in 1945, I'm going to make the other bet, you know? I mean, there's just, you know, I, I, I try and look at Truman and say, well, where, what would I do in that situation? And I have a hard time getting around the idea that I, I, I can't see how I would do anything different because I'm the commander in chief of all those GIs who have to go up the beaches there. And what are you going to tell their families? Like, I had this thing that could have stopped the whole deal right there, but sorry, we went, you know, fighting house to house through Kyoto. Uh, so I, I, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's useful looking back at historical moments to try and uh, be cognizant of what people knew at the time rather than, like, trying to read back things that we now know about it. Uh, I could probably take one more if anyone had one. Or, all right, thank you very much. We will see you hopefully next month. <laughs>